trying to get. I'll stick around for a minute. Where is it? Can I just reload? Awesome. Well, we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, so thank you all for coming to our informational session on the $100,000 pitch competition for diversity and inclusion. Uh, uh, just to introduce myself before we get started, my name is Haley Netherton. I'm a Venture Associate here at Capital Factory. If you have any questions after the informational session, you can shoot me an email at Haley at CapitalFactory.com or follow me on Twitter. A lot of people um, tweet at me, not just my mother, other people too. Mm -hmm. um, tweet at me to get information. I tweet a lot about uh, the Austin startup scene, the Austin fundraising scene, and my feelings on Game of Thrones. <laughs> so if you're interested in any of those, uh, give me a follow on Twitter at, at Haley Eloise. So before we get started, um, I know there's a couple people in here who are new to Capital Factory. So I wanna talk about who we are, who Capital Factory is as an organization. And a large part of who Capital Factory is as an organization is based on where we're located. So for those of you who don't know, we are located in Texas. Already drop a knowledge on you. So one of the biggest questions I get from startups is, if I'm a startup and I wanna be successful, shouldn't I really be in the Valley? Or shouldn't I really maybe be in New York? And the answer, 99 times out of 100, is no, not really. If you're a startup, we here at Capital Factory believe that you are actually being in Central Texas, you're actually in one of the best, if not the best spots in the world to start a technology company. And we have the data to back it up. According to Governor Abbott, if Texas were a country, we'd actually be the 10th largest economy in the world. That's just Texas on our own from a global perspective. But from a national perspective, we're killing it as well. Everyone knows that Texas has a relatively cheaper cost of living versus the Bay and New York, and that our tax laws are very favorable for both individuals and for corporations. But there's also two other big reasons that Texas is so advantageous for startups. Number one, we're actually tied with New York um, for, the, uh, for the number two spot in the country as the state with the most Fortune 500 company headquarters. Texas and New York each have 52 Fortune 500 companies, and California, though, is not that far ahead with only 54. So what that means is if you're a company who's looking to sell to corporations, looking to partner to corporations, or uh, eventually might want to be acquired by a corporation, you're actually in a really great spot to do that. The other major thing that makes Texas so competitive is our geography. Texas has four of the top 11 largest cities in the country and four of the top 11 fastest growing cities in the country, all within a two to four hours drive of each other. So that's Houston, San Antonio, Dallas, and Austin. So that means that you have four of the largest and fastest growing markets in the country, all within arm's reach. A lot of startups that start here in Austin, the first place they expand to is Houston or Dallas or San Antonio and vice versa. It's a large market where you, you can get a lot of market share, but it's also close enough where you can go down and check on the business within a day's drive. So this is what led us here at Capital Factory to recently release our Texas Startup Manifesto. What we mean by that is that we here believe that Texas will eventually rival and surpass Silicon Valley because of our geographic advantage of having such large markets all within two to four hours drive of each other. We, each city has really unique strengths that we can all lend to each other. Dallas is a huge retail hub. Houston obviously is, a, is the capital for energy, oil and gas, and health. San Antonio is becoming a huge leader in cybersecurity. Obviously, we here in Austin have been leaders in the tech industry for years. Oh, yeah, so Texas. Mm -hmm. uh, so what that means is, is that we, Capital Factory, want to be the leaders of, of creating this one large Texas uh, startup metropolis. So we obviously started out in Austin, we've recently expanded to Dallas, and we're hoping to go to Houston and San Antonio next. But what that also means is that we're trying to be the leader, we are bringing our resources to these other cities and bringing their resources here. So we're bringing investors to Dallas, we're bringing corporate executives from Houston to Austin to meet with our companies there, vice versa with San Antonio as well. So what that also means is that we are a Texas-wide organization, we're not just Austin anymore. 
We work with companies that are headquartered in Dallas, Houston, and San Antonio, and everything in between. So, so we recently um, announced our expansion to Dallas with a partnership with the DEC uh, a couple weeks ago. So if you have any other further questions about that, if you're a Dallas-based company, uh, we'd love to talk to you a little bit more about um, some of the unique advantages that being a Dallas-based company, but also being involved with Capital Factory has. So that's about where Capital Factory is located. So what about Capital Factory? We were started in about 08, 09 by our executive director, Josh Baird as a three-month um, uh, summer boot camp-like accelerator. However, after that first summer, uh, Josh and the other founders really realized that they wanted it to be something more. They wanted to create a place where entrepreneurs could go to meet their first customer, their first investor, their first corporate partner, their first co-founder, their first employee. They wanted to create a place that was the center of gravity for all things entrepreneurship in Texas, which is really what we are today. And the easiest way to think about what we do is to break it into four different quadrants. Firstly, we're an event space. We held 900 events last year with 100,000 people through our doors. That includes uh, all the major meetups in town, so food tech, ed tech, music tech, health tech, fintech, take a word, put tech on the end, we probably have a meetup about it. That includes hackathons, uh, corporate, uh, corporate innovation summits, corporate executive events, uh, includes um, summits that sometimes we put on, sometimes outside organizations put on. We recently held our Women in Tech Summit about two weeks ago. We had over 300 women from across the state and really around the country come to talk about issues that pertain to women in entrepreneurship and women in tech today. We're also a co-working space. Obviously, we need a place for our companies to work. We have 60,000 square feet in downtown Austin, here in the downtown Omni. So we have the 16th floor, uh, which is obviously what we're on now. We have the fifth floor and we have the first floor. We also have close to 1,000 members that include uh, startups, uh, entrepreneurs, and uh, corporations. So if we're an event space, we're a co-working space, we're also an accelerator and a venture fund. So our accelerator is a very different model from most other accelerators you probably know. I think I just mentioned that we started out as a, um, as a three month summer boot camp like accelerator. That's your typical kind of cookie cutter accelerator model. That's a great model, obviously we used to run that model. But what we realized about eight-ish years ago is that different founders go through different pain points at different times in their growth cycle. And different founders, different teams need different things at different times in their growth cycle. So if the kind of boot camp-like <laughs> model is akin to a high school program, where everyone goes to the same courses, the same classes, and everyone graduates together um, at, a, at a demo day or what have you, um, and you graduate and you're done, um, our model is more akin to a PhD program where we provide um, different benefits and resources for our companies, but they pick and choose what to take advantage of on their own time. And it comes in a couple different thing, ways. One, uh, our accelerator companies have six months of free membership here at Capital Factory. That membership includes workspace for as many members of your team as you have. Um, that workspace also includes things like monitors if you need VR equipment, AR VR equipment, we have that here as well. Um, access to our gym, access to reserve out conference rooms, uh, phone booths, um, you name it. And then, um, and then we also provide our companies with $250,000 in um, web hosting credits, rack space credits, AWS credits, and other similar perks from our corporate partners. But the real main ROI of being in Capital Factory and the real main ROI of being in our accelerator is the different people that you're going to meet. And they come in a couple different buckets. So one is our mentor network. We have 160 mentors here on site in Austin that are the most active investors and entrepreneurs in Central Texas. It's people like Brett Hurt who found a bizarre voice and dated that world. It's people like Melly Price who founded Frontgate Tickets and is now the head of technology commercialization at Dell Med. It's partners and investors from big names like Silverton and Live Oak. It's subject matter experts like the CMO, the Chief Marketing Officer of WP Engine. So whether you have a specific um, uh, subject need, whether you really need help on, you really need a, a marketing ninja, or you need to talk to an entrepreneur who has, has been in your industry, has done what you've done before, whether that's in ed tech, fintech, uh, um, gaming, AR, VR, health tech, what have you, we probably have someone here who can help you. 
Um, in addition, we're also part of the 1776 Union Platform, which gives our uh, companies access to 700 mentors across the globe. So if your company has maybe a real niche or specific problem that nobody in Austin here has had, maybe somebody in Seattle or New York or London has. One of our companies recently told me that one of the best mentoring sessions they had was with a mentor in Dubai, who then later ended up investing in the company because they believed in them so much. Again, that's not something that would have happened if, they weren't, uh, if we weren't part of the 1776 Union platform, if they weren't part of Capital Factory. So if mentors are one of the uh, people that we, uh, we introduce our uh, accelerator companies to, the other big group of people are investors. So the benefit of being the center of gravity for entrepreneurs is that we're also the center of gravity for everyone who's attracted to entrepreneurs. One of the main groups that are attracted to entrepreneurs are investors. So this includes investors who are in our mentor network. About a, um, a little under a third of our mentors are investors themselves. Um, like I said earlier, partners from every major VC shop in the area, including a lot of family offices, um, angels, and super angels. CTAN, which is um, tied with uh, Han, which is the Houston Angel Network, the Central Texas Angel Network here in Austin, um, is one of our partners as well, and is actually one of the most active angel networks in the country. Um, so that's investors, so that includes uh, investors in our mentor network, investors who are in our partners network, investors who have invested with Melly Price or invested with Josh Bayer before, as well as investors who are coming through Austin, which they do pretty much every other day now due to our status as a major tech hub. Investors who are coming through Austin because of who we are, because we're the center of gravity for entrepreneurs, they're coming through Capital Factory. And when they're coming through Capital Factory, they're emailing either Josh or Gordon Doherty, our managing uh, director of our accelerator, saying, hey, who should I meet with? They then forward that to my team, and we match make with our portfolio, with our accelerator companies, and uh, figure out what their investment thesis is, figure out who we have in our portfolio, who's raising, whose investment thesis um, they would meet, and match them together. During our VIP lounge, during South by Southwest, uh, we had a VIP lounge over on the, on the other side of the 16th floor for about three to four days. During those three to four days alone, we had close to 200 investors in that lounge, who was also sitting in that lounge, our accelerator companies. These are just some of the names that were in, uh, that have been in within Capital Factory in the past couple months. These names include major names like Backstage Capital, Live Oak Venture Partners, Shasta Ventures, uh, uh, Andreessen, Kleiner, Kleiner Perkins, et cetera. And so whether you're raising a, a seed round of 500K or you're getting ready to raise uh, your Series A or beyond, we help our companies um, meet investors who would be interested in investing in them. So if we introduce our companies to mentors, we introduce our companies to investors, we also introduce our companies to corporations and government agencies. So as capital factories, we ourselves were scaling, and what we realized is that a lot of corporations really want to work with startups, but they don't necessarily know how. They're not very good at it. Uh, corporations typically have super long sales cycles. Uh, it could take nine months to get a contract with a corporation, but a lot of times if a startup doesn't get that contract within nine months, they could be dead, or maybe they won't get enough traction to meet their fundraising goals. So we work with corporations um, who we have official partnerships with on a daily basis to work with our startups. That includes corporations like Walmart, who has a desk here, who's right outside of there actually, Booz Allen Hamilton, Microsoft, Merck, and other big names like that. This also includes corporate uh, executives who are coming through Austin. This happens so often now that we actually have a full-time VIP coordinator. Her whole job is just to meet with corporate executives and government agency executives who are coming through Austin, who are then coming through Capital Factory and wanting to meet our startups. Not necessarily for acquisition, although that has happened, it's to license their technology to be their first partner, to be their first customer. Um, uh, about two weeks ago, you may have seen it, T Tim Cook with, uh, with Apple came through Austin, and when he did, he came through Capital Factory. And our, some of our startups who are developing iOS, um, iOS-related technologies, got to demo their technology to Tim Cook. Uh, Whitney Wolf was also here that same day. She's the founder of Tinder and the founder and current CEO of Bubble. Same thing. This is, these are some of the things that are happening on a, on a near daily basis here at Capital Factory. So um, I talked about corporations, but the same thing goes with government agencies. If corporations are hard to work with and have long sales cycles, take that and double it, and that's government agencies. So we're very fortunate here to be um, one of two to three spots in the nation 
to be a hub for a program called DIUX, that's Defense Innovation Unit Experimental. And what that really means is that the Pentagon has a desk here at Capital Factory. Which we're pretty sure it's bugged, but no. <laughs> yeah. uh, no, Zach's the guy who Zach, the guy who's stationed here is great. But what that means is that um, they have created a fast track through the government to work with startups. So former Secretary of Defense, Defense Ash Carter, has been here more than once. And on the second time he was here, he was here to tout the fact that he met a startup through DIUX, and 30 days later, they had a check from the government. I don't even get my IRS refund that fast. So that's definitely a boon for our startups who want to work with government agencies. We also have a lot of relationships with the state of Texas government, as well as the city of Austin. Uh, Mayor Adler is a huge um, proponent and a big um, a supporter of Capital Factory. He comes in and works with and speaks with our startups on a very frequent basis. So there are mentors, there are investors, there are corporations and government agencies. There's a lot of different opportunities that are raining down on our accelerator companies. Um, that can be pretty difficult for them to sort through. So we actually have three people who's, who are called startup champions. Their full-time job is to meet with our portfolio companies, meet with our accelerator companies, and uh, match make them to the opportunities and uh, people who can help them mitigate their pain points and accelerate their growth. So for example, if I'm, let's say I'm an ed tech startup and I'm getting ready to raise my seed or series A, um, I have a few tweaks I need to make in my business model. I need to do a little bit more research around uh, my target market maybe. So I'm gonna meet with my startup champion and tell them that. They're gonna be like, great. First, go meet with the CEO of Simitas Learning. He's one of our mentors here. Obviously he knows ed tech really well. He's gonna help you kind of figure out that, that, that market discovery or that target market you should initially be attacking. Then after that, all right, you're getting ready to raise or maybe you're halfway through your raise. First, go meet with Gordon Doherty. He's the managing director of our accelerator. He's really good at fundraising strategy. He's gonna help you figure out how, how much should you raise, when should you raise it, what should it look like? Am I doing a price round? Am I doing a convertible? No. What should the terms be looking like? Um, if I'm doing a price round, what type, type of valuation should I be looking at? Things like that. And then after that, you're going to be hmm? Come back up. And then after that, you're going to go meet with Josh Baer. Uh, he's really good at pitching, and you're going to go to pitch practice with him. The thing we always joke about with Josh is that if Steve Jobs came in pitching Apple, Josh would probably find something he could fix in his pitch, which is a good thing because you'd rather Josh tell you that than an investor just not understand or not like your pitch and just not invest. So then after that, after we, uh, we work with you on your fundraising strategy, we work with you on pitching, then, um, then after that, your startup champion is going to be like, all right, great, let's get together <coughs> with Josh and Gordon, and let's come up with a targeted list of investors. These are investors in our network who we can uh, make introductions uh, to, who we believe would be a best fit for your startup, who we believe would be most likely to invest in your company. Do the same thing with corporations, you do the same thing with government agencies and other opportunities that your, uh, your company might need in order to succeed. So that's our accelerator. Then if we're in event space, we're a co-working space, we're an accelerator, we're also a venture fund. And there's kind of two different prongs of our venture fund. Firstly, we have fund five, which acts as a normal C to series A stage fund. Through fund five, we've been the most active investor in Texas startups since 2013. And then last year, we raised a micro fund with 50 of the most active investors and serial, uh, uh, serial entrepreneurs in the Central Texas area. And that's what we're using to run these $100,000 pitch competitions or challenges. So the, the reason we wanted to do these challenges is we wanted to create opportunities to invest in entrepreneurs who maybe we wouldn't have invested in otherwise. So we're running these every other month with different themes. The first one we ran was back in February, and it was a quit your job challenge. We were looking for an early first time entrepreneur who had an awesome technology, who needed that $100,000 runway to quit their job and work on their idea full time. The person we ended up finding, um, actually just left the room, but his name is David Zachary. He was 19 at the time, he's now 20 as he reminds me, but he was 19 at the time. David came, um, uh, figured out that you have tiny little microscopic eye movements that actually show emotional intent. Specifically, it can show if you're lying. So really awesome technology. He moved here from LA, has since um, done very well. He's hired a couple PhDs, um, and has been in uh, several of his fundraising now with <laughs> investors on both coasts who we inter helped introduce him to, and is in talks with different government agencies for contracts. 
because we're uh, David is not somebody who we necessarily would have found or invested in without that um, without that challenge, without that pitch competition, and he wouldn't have gotten those opportunities if we hadn't done so and brought him in a capital factory. And so the pitch competition that we're here today for is the diversity and the hundred thousand dollar diversity and inclusion challenge. Here at Capital Factory, we are committed to um, to empowering and supporting uh, diversity in the technology industry. Um, that includes uh, um, people who have been historically underrepresented and underfunded in technology and um, tech companies. That includes women founders, founders of color, Latinx founders, people in the LGBTQ community, etc. Um, we've done several initiatives throughout the year to try to promote that, including our Women in Tech Summit. Um, I myself am the co-founder of the LGBTQ uh, in Tech Meetup, which is going to have, um, which kicked off a couple weeks ago during Austin Pride, and is going to have another Austin Meetup, um, actually all on dating apps and during Startup Week. So be on the lookout for that. That'll be pretty exciting. Uh, and then we wanted to uh, kind of cap off August Women's Month and show how serious we are about bringing up uh, diversity in tech by uh, holding a $100,000 competition uh, only for investing in diverse founders. And so, yeah, so that brings me to the competition that we're doing right now. And so what this means is we're looking for a first-time entrepreneur in tech who is a member of one of those underrepresented uh, communities. In order to apply, uh, you apply on AngelList, which I'll pull up the, uh, the AngelList link in a minute. Apply on AngelList. The application is due September 15th. So one of the things to note, though, about, uh, about who we are as an investor is that we're always a strategic investor. And so the winner of the Capital Factory $100,000 Diversity and Inclusion Investment Challenge doesn't just get an immediate $100,000 investment from Capital Factory. They are also put into the accelerator for not just for six months, but for an entire year. So not only do we invest, but then we put you into our accelerator, which means we're actively on a daily basis introducing you to other investors, introducing you to corporations who could be uh, potential partners and customers, introducing you to people who could be a potential co-founder, potential um, you know, first lead engineer, helping you hire out your team, um, introducing you to the who's who of investors and entrepreneurs in Austin who can help advise you and help mentor your company. Uh, I'll take questions at the end. And so who are we looking for? So what kind of a, a stage or level of company are we looking for in the, in the competition? It, it honestly depends. Um, however, that being said, uh, most companies that come through our accelerator um, are a little bit later in that they do have paying customers and an MVP. That's not always the case. For example, a lot of times in hardware, uh, you have, companies have to do a Kickstarter in order to get enough funding to build out their MVP. However, um, uh, having an MVP and having uh, paying customers is a good start. Uh, if you want more information on um, some things that we're looking at, I would go and look at a blog post that Josh Bayer wrote back in December. It's called How to Raise 500K in Austin. And the reason I point people to that blog post is because it's going through all the different um, metrics that investors look at when you're raising your seed round. And 500K is you know, like a generic amount for the seed round, but it's really seed and above. And those different um, qualifications uh, include a team to believe in. Why are you, um, why are you the person to solve this problem? If you're solving something, if you're an ed tech company, you're solving something in ed tech. Have you ever been a teacher before? Have you ever worked in education before? Um, if you're in AR VR, do you have you used AR VR before? If you're in health tech, have you sold to a hospital before? Things like that. Team to believe in. It's also um, a market size, a big enough market size. How big is your market? Uh, generally speaking, in order to generate um, uh, VC level, angel level returns, you need to be in a market size that's about a billion dollars and above. So are you in a big enough market? And then traction, meaningful traction. It's hard to tell companies what that means because that means different things from industry to industry and whether you're B2C or B2B. If you're B2C and you have one sale, that could be, you know, maybe you sold one $5 app and it was to your mom. Uh, if you were, but if you're B2B and you have one sale, maybe you have one contract with Deloitte that's actually worth $100,000. means very different things. So um, uh, Josh goes through in that blog post kind of the different metrics and the different um, things to look at when you're evaluating whether um, you think you might be a good fit. So um, yeah, so applications are due next Friday, uh, next Friday, September 15th. However, I will say if you're interested in applying, 
Um, if I were you, I would not wait until the last minute. The reason being is that uh, there are two venture associates, uh, myself and uh, Kelsey, and we go through every single application. So uh, there's always a kind of waterfall at the end of everyone applying at you know, 5 p.m. on the last day. And so that doesn't give us a lot of time to um, look at your company, to talk to you, to find out what your company is all about. So it's a lot uh, more beneficial. It's in the favor of the founder if you apply earlier. So we have more time to speak with you, find out, you know, ask you questions, um, dig a little bit deeper on the company. Cool. So um, yeah. So upcoming opportunities, we will be accept we accept uh, applications for accelerator every other month. Um, the next time we will be accepting applications for the accelerator is in October. Um, so those applications are due October thirteenth, and the hundred thousand dollar inclusion challenge applications are due on September 15th. So now we'll open up for questions. Uh, you said earlier, uh, first time entrepreneurs. Do you mean like first time like six successful entrepreneurs? Or like, like let's say you tried to start up and it like went sideways and it failed and you never made any money or something like that. Yeah, you, that's fine. Yeah, oh, so sorry, what, so okay. what, we're, what we're saying by that is like you've you already mean, exited for $100 million. Okay. You probably don't that's, have that much. Yeah, that's what I thought. Yeah, yeah, it's that's not, that. okay. you don't have as hard a time fundraising. So. Okay. Um, so, two questions. One to that, what if I manage to sell a business with a $7,000 profit, does that count? Depending, I think, go ahead and apply. business and I was 11. Go ahead. Um, <laughs> you made $7,000 when you were 11? Yes. Oh, that's awesome. I made $7 at a lemonade stand. I thought it was cool. <laughs> cool. Awesome. Yeah. Well, I have oh, yeah. 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 a question. Um, sorry. Um, what if all of the founders are not here in Texas? Mm -hmm. What if the other founders are in another country? That's a great question. So um, the benefit that you can get out of Capital Factory is directly correlated with being able to be here. So if you were in Dallas or Houston or San Antonio, um, that means that you have reliable transportation and can um, come in whenever it's important. So when investors are here, um, when uh, corporations are here, you can come in to meet with mentors. And a lot of times we don't know about that until um, you know, the last minute. You know, Tim Cook did not give us a month's advance <laughs> notice when he was coming in. So, but if you're in Houston or Dallas or San Antonio um, and you have reliable transportation and are willing, you know, if we call you and say, hey, you want to come demo your app to Tim Cook, you can jump in the car and come in and do that and take advantage of that. So as far as people um, in places outside of that, having team members outside of that, we say at least having the core, um, the core decision maker here in either in Austin or in Central Texas. So that means that you can make decisions on fundraising, you can make decisions on um, on corporate contracts, things like that. That's usually the CEO, but it really makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's helpful. Yeah. 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 Um, so I have two questions, so I'll tell them because I took the phone. <laughs> <laughs> So we talked about a team to believe in, mm -hmm. and your examples were, um, this is an ed tech company, have you ever been a teacher? Mm -hmm. What type of feedback would you give to someone who's essentially a career switcher, or someone mm -hmm. who's working on a project that may be their passion, but mm -hmm. doesn't necessarily align with their prior career experience? Mm -hmm. so that's the first question. The second one would be, when you're looking at an MVP, um, talk to me a little bit about how you guys evaluate that, or, or what you think about when you're Gotcha. So to answer the first question um, about team to believe in, what if you don't have experience necessarily in that field? So um, one, we look at have you been successful in something else before? Um, have you were you early promoted at work? Were you you know were you uh, maybe in the military? Um, something maybe in a profession that took like the military that took a lot of self discipline. Um, and then if you don't have necessarily as much experience in that field, what did you do to research that field? Did you, have you talked to people? So hearing, oh yeah, I talked to two people and one of them was my neighbor, not that impressive. Hearing, I went out and interviewed personally 100 people and I, this is everything that I did to research this market and this is how I taught myself how to uh, code or how to develop VR, that's a lot more impressive. And so that's not the only thing that we do look at. So then um, if maybe your team isn't as experienced in that field, look at some of the other uh, qualifications like the market size or things that can help kind of offset that. And then to your questions on v MVPs. So the reason we say um, usually MVP is because in order to have paying customers, generally speaking, you have to have an MVP. Mm -hmm. 
And the reason we say paying customers is because that shows that people in the market actually want it, that it's not just something maybe, it wasn't just maybe a problem or pain that you had, that this is you know, widespread and that there's a market for it. Um, that's why I kind of said usually. So again, a lot of times in hardware, you have to, um, you have to fundraise before uh, you create an MVP just to get enough money to create the prototype. And so in hardware and things, if you have a Kickstarter and you can convince people to pay you for that product before you've even, even built it, it's a huge sign to us that, that that's a huge market that people want that, that that's a real pain. Okay. Oh, okay. Well, mm -hmm. I actually have one question. Um, Right off the bat, um, you know, you're talking about how hardware, it makes sense, you know, you can, let's say, apply without actually having paying customers. Are there, uh, is there any, let's say, when do you guys decide, when, let's say if someone has a startup product mm -hmm. and there's software, but they're, they're developing that product, would you say don't apply? I mean, where's the thin line between how can you, you know, apply for the challenge without having a, a product that's fully launched? Mm -hmm. Or should you not at all, period? I would say no, I always encourage, um, if you're interested, go ahead and apply anyway. And the reason being is that even if you want, it's hard to tell you, you know, right now about knowing more about your product, the industry, you know, what's early and what's not, it's always a huge gray area. And again, it always depends on company to company, industry to industry, target market to target market. But the, the benefit of applying is that we go through every single one of those applications and you're on our radar. So maybe even if you're a little too early this time, uh, maybe for you still meet the qualifications for one of our next challenges, or maybe you want to become part of our accelerator, which again um, introduces you to investors, corporations, all that good stuff. Um, then we're, we're tracking you. And then when you come back maybe in two to three months and we said, hey, maybe work on these few, uh, two to three things, or um, uh, go close, that, close that first customer and then come back in and um, let's talk again. And then when we see that a founder has done that, that's a huge signal to us that um, your team is serious about this and that your team is on a growth trajectory. Okay. I, I like three questions, very strategic questions. Mm -hmm. One is, you talked about 100K, right? Mm -hmm. Now, it is how many people do you actually select out of uh, you know, the, the, the people that are applying? Mm -hmm. Second is, you know, what kind of you know, uh, contractual obligations you have? You know, like they have are, are you, uh, is it equity based? You know, you, take some equity for that. Mm -hmm. If so, then you know what are the general rules. Mm -hmm. uh, third, uh, you talked about all the services where you have mentors, right? Mm -hmm. Now, generally, I mean, these are people who are outside the industry. Like when I applied, you know, it asked me, like, do you want to be a mentor, right? Mm -hmm. Now, I may not have all the time to actually come and talk to all the startups. Mm -hmm. So that that time would be limited. How much time can be, you know, how much time do they really allocate to when you have like 700 startups? What mm -hmm. kind of time can be allocated by these mentors? Mm -hmm. So at least there's three questions, and I have you know two more following that. Gotcha. So, um, sorry, what was your first question? How many? How many? How many, how many, how many do you select, yeah. and then yeah. do you do equity swap, and what do you do? Yeah. So um, as far as how many we select, so um, we unfortunately only have one. You know, limited amount of money so there will be one winner uh, of the, so only one there's one winner okay. of the hundred thousand um, dollar investment however so we go through all the applications and then we'll select finalists about five to six uh, generally depending and then those five to six finalists we will invite to a pitch day a demo a um, assessment day with the capital factory partners and they will pitch to the capital factory partners who will then uh, decide the eventual winner the finalists in the last several rounds, the partners were so impressed with them that they fast-tracked them through the accelerator um, rather than having them apply to the accelerator and interview in our normal process. Yeah, equity, I mean, what, what is So it is equity-based, so it is an investment. Right. And so whether we um, negotiate that with the companies when we invite them to, with the finalists when we invite them to the, uh, the interview day. And that's on a case-by-case -case basis. Okay, the mentors? The as far as uh, how much time do the mentors have? So we have 160 mentors, we generally, uh, generally ask the mentors to give a couple of hours a month. A lot member, a lot of mentors are a lot more active than that. Depends on what's going on in their uh, work life or uh, personal life at that time. As far as how much time do they have for the companies, a lot of our companies um, make good relationships with our mentors and end up, who end up signing on as advisors. Finding a good mentor is a little bit like speed dating. You, sometimes you have to try out a few um, before you find one that really clicks and that who is, um, really meshes well with your team and with your company. 
Um, so part of the job, our Startup Champions job, is to make sure that, especially for our portfolio companies, if they, for accelerator companies, I mean, uh, if they want to get in to see a mentor, our Startup Champions job is to make sure that they get in and are able to meet with that mentor and um, uh, ask them the questions that they need. Yeah, so one, one just uh, you know, related question to that is, mm -hmm. see, these are all IP, right? I mean, these are like protected IPs. When people apply, mm -hmm. do you, do you, you know, have a system We tweet that, about everything. So do you have, <laughs> you know, <laughs> yes. because, you know, it's an idea which somebody is trying to share, right? I mean, mm -hmm. you know, it could be like, you know, just going into, you know, a deep black space. So do you, do you have any kind of, like, do you sign a countersign, any kind of, uh, uh, say IP protection for somebody who applies to you? No, we don't. And um, I think you'll be hard pressed to find an investor who will. Uh, that being said, we uh, have worked mm -hmm. with thousands of startups over the years and we've never had a problem with that. Um, we're all professionals here. I'm actually a CPA myself, so very cognizant of, um, of information privacy. Mm -hmm. And what you share with us is only shared within the venture and accelerator team. What's if uh, Capital Factory has a competitor in its portfolio? Is that taken into consideration? Like, would you take two That has, or? it's, that's been very, very rare um, that it's it's a direct competitor. Sometimes startups think that they're competing and then really they realize, you know, kind of down the road, maybe one pivots or what have you, that they're really not that much of a competitor. But as far as if, the, if they are, our position is, is that we, um, you know, we're invested in both of you and the success of both, and so we kind of let the market decide. So if there's an awesome investor who is interested in, maybe it's two ed tech companies that do similar things, we introduce them to both and then let the investor decide who to invest in. Quick question. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Me? Okay, yeah. Uh, I was gonna ask, um, do, like, does the accelerator, are you guys like more partial to like software than hardware or is it just like balance? Like more or less like how often like percentage wise do you guys like take app companies versus like a hardware kind of startup? Yeah, no, um, so think of our, so within tech we have a little bit of everything. So we have healthcare, health tech, uh, real estate tech, fintech, ed tech, hardware, software. Um, think of it as a reflection of all the different um, types of technologies in Central Texas. So we definitely have hardware. It's probably about maybe 10-ish, maybe a little bit more percentage of our current portfolio. So that's because hardware companies are about 10-ish percent of the startups that are coming out of Central Texas right now. Yeah. Okay. Um, I, I like this entire concept where you've created an ecosystem, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, like I told you in my email, I'm here just visiting Austin. Mm -hmm. So this was, you know, I wanted to visit and see, you know, how the ecosystem works here. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, I come from India and, you know, I mean, we have a similar ecosystem there your startups and you know activities like this uh, with the 700 startups and you know maybe thousand plus companies which are there and they're all grouping in the same space right in the startup space where the funding is a problem you know the vision to you know the time to reach the market uh, clientele reaching the clientele all these are big issues with them now how do you ensure that you know uh, they reach the right development companies if they want to like you know take help from other companies so that you know they have a limited uh, say say funding they want to make an mvp or they want to create a product in the minimum time how do they how do you ensure that they interface with the software companies which are outside do you do that the same way like you know you got together as you know before this i took the tour right mm -hmm. it's a beautiful concept because people can know what you're doing and so on so the same way do you have anything where you expose all the different software companies which you know probably can help them uh, to deliver the product faster, because at the end of the day, you know, they are grouping with that. Do yeah. we help companies deliver products faster? No, for your startups, do you really link them with the software companies which are outside, so that, you know, that ecosystem can fit? With, do we link our, our companies with corporations? Yeah, different companies or, you know, software companies outside, yeah. He's talking about outsourcing. About outsourcing? Yeah, so yeah I mean, you know, like, like yeah, outsourcing, yeah. Um, if companies do want to outsource developers, um, we have companies who have done that. Um, yeah, that's something I'm sure we can help with. Like, you know, promotion, you know, where you bring companies, you know, who can help. Because, you know, as an entrepreneur, you have limited time to go to the market. You have limited funds. Mm -hmm. You know, they're grouping with a lot of ideas. You have do great mentors. You have great investors. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, I mean, they may be a one-man shop. You know, I mean, they, they may not really know, you know, how to get the product out. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so the, one of our, one of the benefits of having 100,000 people through our doors is that we know 
lot of people. Um, whether those are people who uh, are just coming out of uh, one of the universities nearby, maybe that's UT or uh, Rice or U of H in Houston or Texas A&M. Um, we have partnerships with um, university programs. We um, partnerships with coding schools. Austin Coding Academy works on our fifth floor, actually. And so that's one of the things that we help our portfolio companies with a lot is hiring out their teams and not just hiring any people, but hiring the right people. Are there any questions online? How much equity? Cool. I'm sorry? How much? It depends on the company. So we, um, for the $100,000 challenge, we negotiate that with the finalists when we invite them to interview day. What's the general average? It depends on the companies. Both in your experience. It depends on the company. So we, <laughs> we negotiate that with the individual companies when they come through. I think it would be for component though. I mean, for someone to actually commit. Wouldn't you think? Uh, some of these companies. Well, yeah, and that's why we in, we negotiate it with individual companies if you're invited to to the pitch day. So, but if you're invited to the pitch day, it's not like it's you know you're not bound and held if you do, if you don't like whatever we negotiate, then you you know you're not required to come. Cool. Doesn't it say safety agreement or convertible? It's a convertible. Okay. Mm -hmm. right, so. I was gonna say we also have so I think I spoke about him earlier uh, the winner of our first hundred k challenge. David Zachary in here with Sensei. If y'all have any questions for him, he came through the program, um, was the winner, moved here from LA. He's doing pretty well. well what's your experience? Yeah, we would like to know that. Can you step out so I can? <laughs> <laughs> so he, he, he just did the act. <laughs> no, I mean, overall, so um, I have a biotech startup, um, and we were the first biotech startup to ever come through Capital Factory. Uh, and I would say on both sides, we were a little bit nervous on the accelerator front, you know, if, if there's any value we can get out of it and how they can help and so on. And I think we would all say, I just had a meeting today with Josh Baer, who's the founder of Capital Factory, about, you know, how are things going? And we're checking in on both sides. I say, it's been like, there's been nothing that the company has needed that we haven't been able to get from Capital Factory. Um, it's just all about kind of what I did, and I think I did a good job at it, is the first two weeks I was here, I learned who everyone at Capital Factory was, and who does what, and sure Haley not. can attest for it, and so like, and like, that's what you gotta do, whether you're just, you know, a, a co-working here, you make sure you have a hundred grand, whatever, you just gotta kind of learn who everyone is and be the squeaky wheel, and uh, just annoy the hell out of them until they give you what you need. And, and what's your startup on? Uh, she did mention it's on. Uh, what do you do? I didn't. I didn't do your official pitch. You're better at it. You want me to? You can. You can. Uh, I, I'll, I'll give you the high technology. That I'll just, yeah. I'll, I'll give you the quick pitch of it. Basically, if you've heard the phrase, the eye is the window to the soul. That's basically what we're building. So the iris of the eye is comprised of two thousand muscle fibers, and we've traced each of those muscle fibers to different lobes of the brain. So by just using a video camera to look at the muscle fibers, we're able to read um, all the activity of the brain. Um, and it's just as good as if you stuck someone in a MRI machine. Uh, only difference being $20 million MRI, $2,000 video camera. Does it remind me, I'll introduce you to somebody in LA, okay? Who's, who's got a hardware and who's, who's working on it already in Canada and US. So if anybody tells you that the eye, uh, the eyes went into the soul. If that's not a good pickup line, it obviously worked for David for years. So. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Did you already it. have an MVP um, done when you applied for it? So I, so I would say biotech is the one industry, I, I, I would say it was one of the few industries that it's physically not possible to have anything until you have money. Because you have to do scientific so degree. Can help you you do scientific, you know? Yeah, so... We're about three years old. We did our first round of funding two years ago, okay. um, and we kind of did all you know. We did you know um, all the initial research and science and all of that. Um, we got to the point in January of like, okay, all the science is done. The, the initial validation is done. It's now time to start build a uh, you know build a um a product around it. Um, and the 100K from the Capital Factory was essentially the the first. Um, the first check in our new round of funding. I guess to answer the other question whoever was asking about what the uh, evaluation is like for the investment and all that, it just kind of, it depends on what stage, you know, the, the company's at. Like, like for us, 
we already um, had a, a, a raise money in the past and we had a set valuation for our new round, so we just were able to use that valuation. Whereas if a company is just an idea or already has a patent filed or so on and so forth, you know, it's a very different valuation of what, you, what you're worth at that point. But the one thing I will say, and don't be mad at me saying this, uh, for those of you that do apply, if you do get invited to the pitch, the email will say this offer is non-negotiable. Everything is negotiable. Cat is out of the bag. <laughs> I was going to ask you, Matt. That's just for life, not just for this. Everything is negotiable. Yeah. How big was your team in LA, and how hard was it to convince them to move to Austin? Uh, we were five people. No one but me moved to Austin, but it was fine. We, uh, I kept them remote for a couple months, and we handed things off to a new team um, here. Um, and the one thing I will say, the talent, because uh, we've, um, we're even uh, I'm hiring additional employees right now. The talent market in Austin is great, regardless whether you're hiring engineers and neuroscientists. There's tons of talent here, um, and we have UT Austin to thank for that. I'm looking at a heavily regulated space and talk about some of the, the politicians who have expressed their interest here, but mm -hmm. how advantageous is it for someone, especially when you talk about state regulation, state regulators and the capital being right there, mm -hmm. that you can start to make introductions, not necessarily to the, the people who are making the policy, but the people who are actually like the workers under, you know, behind the scenes that can tell you this is what they really mean. Is that something that's part of the, the network you can introduce a company into? So we have people who have sold the government before. We have people who were um, government officials as, as mentors. Um, we have people who have a lot of experience kind of going through those agencies, whether that's kind of from a smart city route, mm -hmm. um, whether you're working you know, on, on new technologies that a city would use for transportation, something like that, or other avenues. Um, that's uh, one thing that our startup champions are really good at, is knowing exactly who we know. And if they, maybe they can't think of anybody off the top of their head, they're going to Josh or they're going to one of our other um, directors and saying, how can we get this person introduced to the people that they need? Okay. So we have time for one more question, cap it off. Was there a star date? Uh, so it, there's, because it's not a structured reg regimented program, there's not an exact start date. Uh, where if, if you were uh, moving here from out of state, or um, something like that, we are flexible. That being said, it's not something, you know, you can, if you win and then you, you know, hey, I'm gonna put this off for six months to a year, that's not necessarily um, what we're going for, but it's not like it, you have to start the next day. Cool. Well, thank you all again for coming. Really appreciated y'all all coming out. Um, uh, again, the applications are on angellist at angel.co slash capital factory slash apply. And if you have any other questions after this, feel free to shoot me an email at Haley at CapitalFactory.com. Thank you. Thank you for coming in. Hey, good, how are you? Hey, Dave. Yeah, I saw a little bit of track. Yeah, I just had a very different. Very different. Yeah, I see my head. All right, thank you. So, generally speaking, it's about 100 people plus, but I have applied. As far as pitching goes, it generally is only about five to six. We only have a certain amount of time. Yeah. Um, um, and I gave this crazy yeah, 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 and he said, why don't you just start selling, yeah, I you, let's use yeah. Yeah. So 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 selling it teaching the yeah. 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 So the next day I started doing yeah. that, uh, we managed to at uh, almost 100% profit margin selling those outfits that I painted in the back because they were hand-painted wearable art. So I did this huge like, flyer campaign. And Mr. T's mom lived in the building with the store was in. And I actually sold the store to Mr. T's mom. 
and you're a seven thousand dollar profit with a sixty forty split. Yeah, I can sign the campaign. Okay, so you will face the picture. Did you plan on that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, that's never happened. Huh? Like, no, 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 we we no, we we did, we did we plan it. We we did it. Yeah. We did it. 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 We Okay. Mr. T. Yeah, it uh, Mr. T at the time was uh, was just becoming famous before then he was a bouncer in a club. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, he played, he played himself and everything. Yeah.